into a world that is for everyone and everyone prospers. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Claudia Sanchez Bajo. She is a fellow researcher at the University of Buenos Aires on the Faculty of Economics. She is a guest professor at University of Cassel, visiting scholar at the LBJ, that is Lyndon Baines Johnson, former U.S. President, the LBJ uh, School of Public Affairs uh, at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, she's the inaugural, ch inaugural chair of the Cooperative Enterprises Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Winnipeg in Canada and is focused in a lot of her research and writing on the relationship of co-ops to the future of work and the dignity of work as well as the role of cooperatives in creating peaceful societies. So please welcome Claudia Sanchez Bajo. Hello, good morning to everybody. I'm Akuru. <laughs> so I have a PowerPoint. Let's see if it's working. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, OK, good. So the interest uh, in connecting cooperatives and peace is uh, becoming quite important uh, in the 21st century. And uh, there is a development report, for example, from the World Bank in 2011 that has uh, said uh, that violence now is breaking the patterns of the 21st century with many more subnational areas falling into conflict violent conflict and with more repeated cycles of violence whereby we think we are arriving to stability and uh, those areas fall back into violence within five years. And this is, uh, should make us think further how we can contribute to create stable prosperity and uh, a peaceful living economy for all. The first thing that comes to mind, actually, is not really peace, but when we talk of peace nowadays, we think it's merely the absence, or most importantly, the absence of violence, which, of course, it's essential to life and to all of us. And this really uh, became um, the mainstream thinking from the 17th century forward. The key idea is that the sovereign actually is the one to ensure peace, so it's a top-down uh, security. And also the importance of law uh, from Grotius in the 17th century in the Netherlands. However, there is an S lacking there, all languages. In the beginning, the concept of peace in languages all around the world Amahoro, Shalom, but also in the English language, Fried or Sib, in Germanic languages, Heping uh, in Chinese, and so on, actually meant much more than that. Meant, meant happiness, prosperity, welfare, well-being, inner peace, uh, cohesion, harmony, and so on. Nowadays, this I'm going to show you just two maps of statistics uh, around the world of 2019. So this is the current situation in terms of fragility in the world. We uh, that uh, what we find we see in blue are the most sustainable uh, areas uh, that are less fragile to crisis, to vulnerabilities in different uh, uh, ways, different aspects, and those in red are the most vulnerable. So we see that the blue areas are actually very few, and uh, the others are in between, and Africa uh, has quite a few challenges. In terms of women, uh, statistics of 2019, again, uh, we see that 
uh, there are a few areas, this time in green, are where women are most physically secure, and those in red, as they go a darker red, are, they are lacking physical security. We see again that we have a lot of work to do in order to ensure that women around the world are secure, not only in terms of livelihoods, but also physically. So, with all this happening around the world, actually we have seen from the last century and in this century that we are coming back to thinking of peace in terms of positive peace. And Linda Groff, this is um, a figure, a graph, that she made of a survey of uh, different types of theories and aspects covered by these theories. And we have gone from thinking that peace is basically the absence of war or maybe the balance of uh, forces uh, among states, nation states or empires, hmm? deterrence, etc to think about structural uh, violence or the lack of it, uh, also feminist theory, and then going further, intercultural mediation, intercultural peace, cultural peace, and then Gaia, Vandana Shiva mentioned uh, Gaia peace uh, two days ago and also inner, outer peace, so the inside individual and how we relate to the rest of the world, including the living, um, other uh, living, um, um, how can I say, animals and the earth. And the aspects now that we cover, we discuss, are all of them, environmental, social, among states, within states, within the community, within the family, gender-wise, within the individuals. This is Galtung, Johann Galtung's uh, formula of peace, just to be brief, because I have a few minutes. So Johann Galtung is considered the father of modern peace studies. And he uh, has managed to do a good distinction between positive peace and negative peace. Negative peace, of course, is very important, but mainly refers to the prevention of violence or diminishing, sanctioning violence against people, against minorities, against other groups, and, of course, uh, reaching wars. But positive peace is based on cooperation. And that means everything that we do to enable peace and build peace. And his formula says, so it's like a formula, where we have more equality and empathy that we are able to diminish the trauma and the conflict that we may have. We have to understand that conflict is part of life. We always have conflict. We have different points of views, different ideas, different interests, different tastes. Uh, the question is not to reach violence, so that we are able to work together, live together, and build a world in peace. So the current approaches in the study of peace, uh, I just, I'm very brief with one slide. Mainly is peace and security, so even including enterprises. So now we, there are protocols in terms of preventing uh, harming or risks in conflict areas, for example. Um, or uh, how we diminish the risk of violence or like gender violence, that's another example. Then we have a lot of publications and theories in terms of peace as management, not only in development projects, but uh, widely uh, in terms of theory of change and also what is called read small and read large. Read small is when we do good in terms of peace building, but it's not necessarily having a wider impact in the whole area or the whole country or for the long term. And writ large is the latter. And then we have peace as a large business. Uh, we have a lot of um, now uh, institutions uh, talking about positive peace. We have the UN Global Compact for Peace. We have also uh, businesses uh, peace awards. And w there is also many publications talking that commerce uh, brings about peace as well. However, we have uh, great disconnects and uh, most of the publications and research actually speak out that peace building, uh, we talk a lot about what, like theory of change, how we change things, how we achieve the targets, but we are not talking about who is doing it and how we are achieving that. 
also peace building as an activity, but not that it's a systemic change. And we have to be working on so many aspects at the same time that they are linked among themselves. And then peace building as uh, uh, social responsibility, but not really valuing local ownership, where cooperatives appear very highly. So where do cooperatives appear in all that? Uh, basically, the first thing is that they appear in post-war, post-conflict transitions. So in terms of rebuilding, de-escalation, demobilization, restarting agriculture, restarting credit, restarting the economy. And that's, of course, wonderful and very, very important. But there are many PhD theses now, MA theses, and some publications, for example, from UNRIST, that are telling us also other parts that we are seeing less, like an iceberg. Huh? And uh, we are seeing that cooperatives also contribute to enhance the protection uh, of women, individuals, groups, the community, that the people are able to situate themselves and have more dignity and therefore they have their capabilities enhanced and take initiatives in their own lives and together, and also peace building as resilient life so that they are able to, like, they feel in their communities uh, safer and they work together. And actually, like cooperatives, uh, we should not take this as a perfect uh, paradise kind of thing. Uh, I'm not saying that. But I will, so mainly as community development. But it goes much more beyond that. I will give you very briefly three examples um, that do not fall into what we see in theory or when we talk of cooperatives in general. For example, here, it will be said later uh, more with more details, many cooperatives, and in particular of women, have brought together the two sides of the genocide, of the conflict. So, and those people worked together and they have rebuilt their humanity, their uh, capacity to see each other in the eyes and to work together to leave behind the hatred. And that's absolutely amazing. When I went to visit Sri Lanka, they told me that in 2009, when the uh, conflict uh, finished, in the north, they went immediately to visit the north to see what they could do to help, also with other uh, cooperative agencies, for example, from Nordic countries, and they found out that the only buildings standing were cooperatives. And the people were telling them that neither side wanted to destroy them because it was the only place where they could meet and the only place where they could, books, they could get books from the outside during the conflict. Again, there is the former UNRIS director who has a publication on Nicaragua who published that uh, the cooperatives in Nicaragua during the conflict, the people were fighting each other outside and they were going back into the cooperative and working together, which is again like, how can this be possible? So this is telling us that cooperatives sometimes is much more than just an economic space, it's a, a space for life and to rehumanize ourselves. In other uh, research, I have found that cooperatives actually uh, take different, uh, contribute in different ways, uh, in different uh, cycles of uh, crisis. So when you have a shock, a crisis, which can be environmental, uh, can be a natural uh, shock like a tsunami or uh, can be a, a war. Then you have cooperatives who ha make great donations, provide great help like direct uh, aid, like humanitarian aid, but also advice uh, and help coping with the shock. And then others are the same help in recovery, in integrating the shock uh, into the, their daily experience, and provide services like health services, education, social, skills training, uh, and jobs, 
as I said before, like restarting agriculture, restarting credit, and so on. All along, they do networking, not only among themselves, but also with the public authorities, with NGOs, with also other businesses in the area. Uh, they restart or they build uh, participating value chains, dialogues, policy dialogues, uh, and cultural mediation. And then, of course, they start and they go on on building sustainable livelihoods, so assets uh, in the community, market access, bargaining power, lowering the costs, and uh, building sustainable livelihoods in every sector that is possible there in that particular region. And then they also help to prepare for the next shock or the next, next uh, crisis in terms of insurance, microcredit, risk transfer, and so on. In my interviews, for example, in Rwanda, I have found that the cooperatives here are doing sometimes all of that together. But it will be explained more later in details by the Rwandan speakers. How do they do that? So beyond the economic contributions, because Galtung speaks empathy and equality, but let's say, how can I, um, translate that uh, into rebuilding, going from fear, where you cannot even move and cooperate with each other, to reach the stage in which you uh, create cooperatives, you create wealth, general wealth, and then also inclusion for all. And what I found is that empathy is a rational process of understanding the other, so it's not emotion, it's really grasping the situation of the other and that the other is a human being like you. And because of that, you begin to understand you have common problems and common needs. And therefore, you begin to build an agency path by which you are able to act upon your own life and your opportunities, and then reaching cooperation and building cooperatives. On the other side, equality. How do we build equality? We, let's say, those people start from nothing, from fear, from losing everything sometimes, having a possibility to situate themselves again. From there, they can envisage how to, let's say, the possibility of empowerment. And then they can raise their voices together. So these two things go together. And by raising their capacity to act together, because they see common needs and common aspirations, they are also capable of requesting and building equality together. That is the way to build positive peace and also inclusion. And then, of course, you have from the macro level is very important and the government level to have a general vision that upholds that, that favors and promotes that, and also with policy that is in the long term. I will end with this um, uh, slide. It's open to discussion. Uh, nowadays, they are trying to come up with indicators for positive peace. This is more like a statistical uh, approach, and uh, it's new. Huh? So it's, uh, this is from a report of 2018. Um, but what it means is that those points that you see together, the blue points together, these are pairwise frequency-related uh, indicators. That means that when one is moving, the others are moving. When one is moving faster, the others are also moving faster. I will mention just a few of them. I don't know if you can read them on the screen, like GDP per capita, uh, the business environment, of course, also for cooperatives, uh, inequality adjusted to life expectancy, gender inequality, uh, youth development, poverty gap, control of corruption, uh, etc. So those are the blue points that are closer to each other, which means there is no trickling down, trickle down benefits. This is raising up at the same time. This is what the peace, positive peace index is showing us. When one of these indicators is moving up, is levering the others up as well. And I think cooperatives can contribute, therefore, to positive peace uh, in a significant and very important way. And if we go back to the beginning, where we find that we have 
so many areas in the world in conflict with repeated cycles of violence, I think we all need to contribute and to think further how we can do that now and for the long term. Thank you. Wow. Um, I, said, I was thinking all the way along of how closely this interrelates to the discussion with Dr. Vandana Shiva earlier in the week, the idea that human beings are connected into the environment within which we exist, and that environment can be positive or negative depending upon how well those human beings collaborate and cooperate. Um, I'd also mention that this idea of equality and empathy in the discussion of positive peace relates very specifically to the cooperative model because we know that trust and reciprocity are, the, are fundamentally foundations of the cooperative model. You don't build trust without empathy and you certainly can't have reciprocal relationships without empathy. So um, thank you very much, Claudia, for setting the stage for us. Um, really, really interesting. I was also thinking, wouldn't it be great if each of us could internalize that and be able to talk about it within our environments. Uh, and the other thing I was thinking of was I, I could imagine an entire course in, in a college curriculum focused not just on the, the theory but also on the, the examples and the, the research that's being done around the world. So thank you again. Our second speaker is Jean-Louis Bonset, National Federation of French Mutual Organizations. He is the president of Cooperatives Europe. So uh, please welcome Jean-Louis Bancel. Bonjour à tout le monde. Comme vient de vous le dire Martine, je vais illustrer l'intérêt de la diversité des langues, là aussi pour construire un monde meilleur. Je tiens à remercier Claudia pour sa présentation et je vais donc en tant que président de Coopérative Europe essayer de poursuivre le cheminement qu'elle nous a présenté d'un point de vue un peu différent. Je ne viens pas là en tant que chercheur, je viens pour vous présenter les travaux réalisés par Coopérative Europe, à la demande de Coopérative Europe dans le cadre des travaux financés par l'Union européenne où sont impliquées Coopérative Europe et la CI pour le développement. Et puis plus globalement, je vais poursuivre en étendant cette, cette matinée de réflexion sur la dimension internationale de la question de la paix. Évidemment, euh, la première chose que l'on a à l'esprit en venant ici, c'est dans ce pays les difficultés qu'a traversé ce pays à travers le génocide. Et euh, Claudia euh, envisageait de le présenter, mais quand nous avons, avec le président Ariel Guarco, déposé une gerbe euh, au mémorial, il y a une, un, dans le musée qui explique le processus de réconciliation, il y a une plaque qui dit le Rwanda a commencé à poser les bases d'un avenir pacifique en élargissant l'accès à l'éducation, à la santé pour tous, promouvoir l'autonomisation des femmes et la création des coopératives. Et donc ça, c'est le local qui a été développé. Je voudrais vous faire savoir, et c'est disponible, que donc Coopérative Europe a rendu public récemment une étude qui s'appelle « Cooperative and Peace, Strengthening Democracy, Participation and Trust ». C'est une étude qui a étudié 20 cas dans 14 pays, euh, pour en citer quelques-uns, mais euh, il y a 14 pays, la Colombie, l'Ouganda, la Syrie. Euh, je voudrais juste donner un exemple euh, sur le continent américain, par exemple. Nous avons pu faire voir comment au Salvador, les coopératives ont pu contribuer à au bon usage des biens communs naturels comme une manière de réduire les tensions euh, dans les communautés. Euh, Claudia l'a dit, je ne vais pas le répéter longuement, les coopératives contribuent à l'instauration d'un climat 
d'apaisement. Nous préférons parler du mot de concorde. Nous sommes dans un pays qui a connu, comme d'autres pays européens, euh, les guerres de religion. Nous sommes dans un pays, ou dans un continent, enfin en tout cas en France, dans un pays qui, pendant la Révolution française, a aussi connu des épisodes qui étaient proches de phénomènes de guerre civile, même si euh, notre épopée nationale ne le qualifie pas comme ça. Et c'est vrai que dans la conception française, le mot « concorde » s'applique plutôt à l'intérieur du pays. J'y viendrai tout à l'heure, le mot « paix » s'appliquant plutôt au conflit entre les pays. Et on va voir qu'un des sujets que je développerai tout à l'heure, c'est l'équilibre entre nationalisme et internationalisme pour les coopératives. Mais sur le premier volet, celui que vient de présenter Claudia, c'est fantastique ce qu'elle présente. En même temps, il ne faut pas se tromper dans l'interprétation. C'est un travail de chercheur, travail descriptif. Il ne faudrait pas en déduire que les coopératives sont des entreprises démiurges, des entreprises capables de, de résoudre par elles-mêmes tous les problèmes. Je voudrais l'illustrer et euh, me réjouir qu'il y a deux jours ou trois jours, a été attribué le prix Nobel d'économie de 2019 à trois personnes, Michael Kramer, Haji Jit Ben Jamar et Esther Duflo, une femme, la deuxième femme, à obtenir un prix Nobel d'économie. Après Eleanor Holström, une grande économiste américaine, sur son travail sur les biens communs, Esther Duflo est une chercheuse donc, sur, euh, française qui a obtenu ce prix Nobel. Sur quoi ont-ils travaillé sur la pauvreté. Vous voyez qu'il y a tout de même un lien entre les questions de développement, pauvreté et de paix. Qu'est-ce qu'ils ont démontré Qu'il y a des facteurs qui contribuent à sortir les gens de la pauvreté. Alors, leurs travaux sont souvent contestés par d'autres chercheurs, parce que c'est ça la joie du travail entre les académiques, c'est qu'ils se contestent les uns et les autres, c'est ça qui enrichit la science. Et par exemple, qu'est-ce qu'ils ont démontré Que quand on envoie les enfants à l'école, il vaut mieux qu'ils n'aient pas faim en même temps qu'on les envoie à l'école. Ça veut dire il n'y a pas besoin d'avoir fait de grandes études. C'est même pas inintéressant d'un point de vue scientifique. Sauf que, qu'est-ce que ça démontre La pauvreté, c'est comme la paix, c'est multifactoriel. Et donc, c'est très compliqué de croire que ce qui n'est qu'une corrélation peut devenir une causalité. Et je pense que c'est ça toute la difficulté, et en même temps c'est ça toute la force de l'analyse intellectuelle, mais nous ne voulons pas, à travers cette présentation ici, devant vous tous, euh, membres du mouvement coopératif à l'échelon mondial, nous faire oublier que les coopératives sont d'abord des entreprises humaines, et que donc ce que démontre le travail de Claudia, c'est que tout ceci est un travail de cheminement, ça ne va pas arriver soudainement parce que dans un pays où il y a des tensions, on parachuterait des coopératives. Soudainement, les problèmes ne vont pas se résoudre. Oui, les coopératives contribuent à la concorde civile, mais elles-mêmes ne peuvent le faire que si elles sont dans un environnement local ou national favorable. Oui, les coopératives ont besoin qu'il existe un état de droit. Et j'y insiste, ce n'est pas... Les coopératives sont des praticiens de la mise en action des principes, qui sont en particulier les principes coopératifs. Mais le respect des droits humains, les coopératives en ont besoin. Je ne vais pas dire qu'elles se nourrissent, mais elles ont besoin de cela. Elles ont besoin du respect de la loi par tous. Elles doivent elles-mêmes la respecter, mais elles ont besoin du respect de la loi. Elles ont besoin du respect de la démocratie. Et donc, moi, mon raisonnement, qui n'est certainement pas scientifique, mais qui est un raisonnement de mise en action, c'est qu'il faut qu'il y ait un environnement, mais que cet environnement, parce que nous exerçons les droits reconnus, contribue à ce que globalement tout le système avance. Donc ce que nous voulons mettre en avant, ce que je veux mettre en avant, c'est la symbiose, la symbiose entre les coopératives et l'environnement. Il y a une interaction. Il n'y a donc pas de simple logique de causalité directe. 
C'est donc un point important et ceci conduit à, pour nous, rappeler qu'au-delà des principes coopératifs, la déclaration adoptée par, sur l'identité coopérative adoptée à Manchester en 1995 énonce pour la première fois des valeurs coopératives. Et ici, devant le président du comité de l'identité coopérative, Martin, je veux vous les rappeler. Ce sont l'entraide, l'autoresponsabilité, la démocratie, l'égalité, l'équité et la solidarité. Donc c'était ça, cette première étape que je voulais vous rappeler, c'est à partir du travail de Claudia de montrer que oui, les coopératives sont des artisans, j'utilise volontairement ce mot, de construction de concorde civile, mais il y a aussi d'autres éléments nécessaires à leur contribution. Je voudrais passer au global maintenant, parce que ce n'est pas tout à fait par hasard que le Conseil d'administration de l'Alliance a choisi ce thème aujourd'hui. C'était parler du local, c'est notre réalité, mais de nous rappeler que si nous sommes ici en tant que représentants participant à un mouvement, c'est que nous sommes des citoyens du monde. Et donc, je voudrais sur ce point vous montrer l'actualité de cette question et revenir aussi à des questions d'histoire. Nous portons une... Oui, le monde coopératif porte une vision du monde. Et ce travail d'aujourd'hui, c'est un travail d'entendement commun sur cette vision du monde. Je vous rappelle que le slogan de l'année internationale des coopératives de l'ONU 2012, c'était des entreprises pour un monde meilleur. C'est simplement pour nous rappeler que les coopératives, elles marchent sur deux jambes. Elles marchent sur la jambe, la jambe du business, mais aussi sur la, la jambe des valeurs. Et donc, euh, il faut se rappeler comment et pourquoi le mouvement... Et je voudrais simplement rappeler que euh, l'Alliance coopérative a été fondée en 1895, à un moment où c'est ce qu'on a pu appeler la première mondialisation. Au sein des nations européennes, il y avait une volonté d'aller dans la modernité. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé c'est que des tensions ont commencé à apparaître. Ceci a conduit au conflit disant, du dialogue entre les nations. C'est pour cela qu'au moment où, dans notre monde, les nationalismes chauvinistes sont en train de renaître, j'insiste sur le chauvinisme, c'est non pas simplement de reconnaître sa nation, mais c'est de dire que sa nation est supérieure à toutes les autres et qu'elle doit dominer les autres. Et donc, sur ce point... Moi, je trouve très opportun que nous ayons ce débat, ne pas le réduire qu'à la dimension locale, parce qu'elle trouve ces sources-là, mais nous la partager entre nous. Euh, C'est clair que pendant un temps, nous avons cru qu'après la Seconde Guerre mondiale, les choses trouveraient un autre tour. Aujourd'hui, euh, certains... Euh, essaye de peut-être se reposer des questions. Moi, je voudrais partager ces points-là et je voudrais juste en terminant vous rappeler ce qu'ont dit nos prédécesseurs en 1920. Excusez-moi du peu, c'était pile il y a 100 ans, au congrès de Bâle. Ils nous ont fixé 17 objectifs. Ils se sont fixés, mais ils nous ont fixé 17 objectifs. Je ne vais pas les reprendre par le menu, mais le dernier objectif était de faire de l'ACI une véritable société des nations efficace, je crois que nous ne sommes que des nains juchés sur des épaules de géants. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Jean Louis. Uh, earlier on in his talk, he had mentioned El Salvador, and it occurred to me that. Uh, my organization working on electrification uh, on the cooperative model in El Salvador and Nicaragua during the civil wars in both countries had a rather unique experience, and that is that regardless of which side happened upon the work that the line crews were doing, they would put down their weapons and help put up the utility poles uh, because they wanted to make sure that that cooperative survived the civil war, which it did. Uh, Many interesting things that Jean-Louis has added to the, the conversation, and I'd particularly like us to think about 
that word internationalist. Um, we know that globalist and globalization as words are under attack to some extent, but uh, the reminder that we are here because we are in fact internationalists, uh, very much committed to a better earth, a better world, um, is, is a really great reminder. Our next speaker is going to come at this discussion from the grassroots and from Rwanda. His name is James Karangwa, and he is currently an investment manager at a rice growing co-op, uh, Coporis, and is a member of that cooperative as well uh, and was involved in its founding. He has a bachelor's degree in business management and finance and banking, working on an MBA now in supply chain and logistics management. And that is a subject he's going to bring to the table here to talk about how, how that local activity interrelates to our specific topic of peace and equality. So please welcome James Karangwa. Good morning, all of you. I'm James Karangwa, and I think I have a, a presentation. So the is next. The cooperative is called Koporolin Hende, as you can see, and my name is Karangwa James, as you can see. Uh, the cooperative is a rice cooperative and it is a primary cooperative. Now the cooperative is, uh, it, it is having uh, the structure which is almost the same like other cooperatives, but uh, I want to mention that the cooperative, as the cooperative grows bigger, we decided to to invest in other businesses, and this is why you can see the structures as big as, as it is, and maybe it will continue to be big, because we have uh, now two departments. Initially, we started as a rice cooperative, and later we diversified in other business, and now it caused us to put another department, and at the top are the General Assembly, Board, uh, Board of Governors, the manager and the departments. Now these are our vision and mission. Our vision is to provide affordable quality and quantitative rice to local, region, and global markets. Our mission is unite and empower members for financial independence and economic stability. Our values, uh, quality of products and services. First of all, rice and other business that we have diversified in. Passion to serve, leading for a better future. Now this is a, a brief history to the cooperative. Kuproli Nende is a, a rice farming cooperative operating in Eastern Province, which is the Negatsubo district of Rwanda. It started in 2003 and registered in 2005 uh, as a recognized cooperative according to the law of Rwanda. It was having, when it, when it started, it was having a only five, 60 members, of which 394 was men, and women was 166. And we were having only 180 hectares of land where we used to produce rice. Currently, the cooperative has 3,761 members Men, the number of men is 2,450, and women, 1,300, 
11 member families are 12,811. These are the members, member families of our, our, our members, of course, but our members uh, 3761. So we have increased the, num uh, the, the, the hectares we are cultivating on now, because we are having 900 hectares, of which only 600 are being used to produce rice. The remaining three we are just using uh, to cultivate on other selected uh, crops like maize and beans. Of course, it was due to the, it was uh, a fund from the government that came into existence and uh, enlarged the land by building infrastructures like two dams we are using to irrigate the marshland. Now, the member share when we started it was 3,731 francs. It was a little money. But by increasing the activities we are doing, the assets increase, uh, increase the value, and this caused the increase of the member share of a person. Whoever gets in with 3,000, now if he or she wants to, to quit, he has to be given such amount, which is uh, 1,000, 16,000. And maybe by the resolutions of the General Assembly, which is coming in this, uh, I think it will be on 28th, we suggest the capital share to increase because we have added more other assets. Now, you have seen that the number is quite big, although it is not uh, like other presentations of other cooperative we had yesterday. So to manage these people, members of ours, we classified our members in two five grades based on agricultural seasons. In fact, this is meant to know better our members' lives so that we can cater for themselves. This is how we grade them. Uh, whoever earns 3,000 200 francs per us, we classify him or her in the grade one, which is better off. And maybe to jump on uh, grade five, who is uh, worse off, can harvest at a season that amount of money. I want to, to insist on, on why we are grading these people or these members of ours. It shows us that approximately 80% of members of Kupurunian are ranking from number one to three, grade one to three, uh, according to the income and that's considered better off. And 20% of our members are worse off. Uh, now grading of members helps the cooperative to allocate the scarce resources we are having. It helps it helps us to know which projects or what projects can we invest in or to pull up the other members from grade five to grade two or to grade one. It helps the cooperative to cater for the daily lives of uh, or problems that uh, one of the members can encounter. Now, basing on the grades we have graded to our people, and uh, the data, databases we are using to know the problems of them, there are some of the services that are rendered to them. First of all, we offer transport services. I want to show you that once we started the cooperative in 2005, six, seven, Members used to carry their produce on their heads or on bicycles. There was no motorcycles and what. From the field to the dry yards and even to the market, they were using bicycles. So to find a solution to that problem, we decided to buy trucks of the cooperative, as you can see, just to solve the problem 
of carrying the produce on head or the back. But again, this is, it is acting as an investment to the cooperative because we are now using the trucks to earn income to the cooperative apart from carrying, uh, providing as a service to our members. Transport uh, services are like that. We have a big marshland of nine hectares, nine, 900 hectares, as I, I said. And uh, to collect the produce from the field, from the farmers up to the market, we use our trucks, and this is uh, somehow economical. It is not costly. We offer agricultural services. When we start, when we started the cooperative, we may find that someone is just cultivating using his or her own funds, which is also limited. And at the end, he could harvest very little, which is, uh, not comp which is less compared to what he has put in. Now the cooperative decided to offer these services. Most of them are appropriate techniques of modern farming, we pay agronomists, by now we have four agronomists and other advisors who are 15 in number to be with the members at the field each and every day so that one can get improved produce, which is his or her income. Others, uh, the, the choice of uh, best seeds. We, we, we multiply seeds for our members and even we use it to sell to other cooperatives, which is rice cooperatives. We have a license from Rwanda Agricultural Board that we are good seed multipliers of rice. Others is to services like using fertilizers and chemicals, of course, for pest management, and looking for better fertilizers to use as uh, we, we, we all know that we have uh, problems of these uh, uh, fertilizers and chemicals. So these are some of the photos that we use. And we are being funded by the FFS, which is uh, from FO, that we have farmer field schools where we coach our members for better practices to come up with uh, high productivity. Agricultural services continues, chemical and pest management, I said that. Uh, it was a bit a problem when we started, but we made a challenge for, 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 for now, other cooperatives are coming to study how we manage to use, the, to, to use this uh, system. We trained only 75 operators who are able to, to spray the whole marshland of 600 hectares five, only, only in five days. This practice helped the cooperative to, to reduce operational costs, of course, and mitigate risks associated with chemical uh, pesticides on health of our members. Initially, when we started, someone could cater for he, him or herself on her plot. It was so costly. It was so costly because one plot only one person who is energetic to spray uh, these chemicals on the, uh, over the plot was, uh, you, 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 ha you, you have to pay, we are paying just a, a thousand. But when we come up with this system, the cost reduced, whereby one only contributes 300,000, because the one that is spraying will spray very many plots and get a lot of money, and one will pay a little. It is also a cooperative in a cooperative. So these are some of the photos of the operators who are doing the same. And we have said that it reduced uh, risks. You may find that at first one could come at, at the cooperative, take the chemical, maybe one day keep at home. It was risky so that young children like babies can take and maybe die for the case. But chemicals are being kept at the cooperative and these guys get from the cooperative direct to the field, finish, and 
the case is over. We also offer welfare services. We have a shop which is catering to our members only because they come with their cards. We have cards that all of the members have their cards, so others are not allowed to buy in our shop because it is somehow cheap compared to other markets and shops. So we buy them in Baruke because we are able to go to the factory and buy without intermediates. So this, we repay this to our members, which is less, and even the cooperative gains. We offer also social services. By doing this, we managed to, uh, to create a fund within the cooperative, which is quite different from the cooperative. But this is a good fund. I advise you, uh, those who are not having this fund, let me tell you some of the services that we offer from this fund. Here is insurance to all members. Our members, even our country has a policy for this to all the citizens of the country, which is called Mituel do Sante. But our members are being paid by the cooperative with their families. As I showed you that member families are over 13,000. This service, for them, they pay later because it is somehow still in, uh, build, building the, the, the fund. But even if someone is just planting for the first season and in the month of May, we have to pay the amount to all the families. After the harvest, in six months, they pay. We pay pension to editors who started the cooperative. Whoever gets 70 years and above start to come, although it is still retro, but we are planning to increase. You know, the cooperative started earlier in 15, uh, it is almost 15 years. It was started by the people who are somehow old and now they are getting old. Now we decided to keep these elders because they did something which is good to us. We pay school fees. We also pay funeral services. Our, uh, our member families, we can get trouble and lose a person, maybe lose a person. Our member can die. We also offer those services and they are not refundable. Like an example, we have uh, statistical data that from six, uh, 216, in the members who are 3761, our 30 members died. Now, when, mem when our member dies, the cooperative through that fund provided a thousand, a thousand, a hundred thousand to the rest of the family to cater for the funeral services and other activities needed. If one is, is a member of the family, not, a, not, not our member, we pay only 50. And we want to increase this because it is good to our members. So these are some of the services that we offer, and it is to support the government program of the government. We diversified, as I say, to other businesses, like we are having poultry farm to empower our members, and we are having a hotel. This is a two-star hotel. To, to make other businesses, we first see what is better to the government, what is needed to the government. In our government of Rwanda, we insist much on, we invested much in hospitality industry. That's why we decided to build a hotel, and it is good. These are the certificates to the hotel. Now, the, uh, the poultry keeping. Okay. We have given, we have been given awards, and this is a, motivate, a, motiv a motivating factor. One of the awards are from national level. You can see members celebrating, and this is a motivating factor to our members. Now, before I conclude, I want to tell 
some remarks to our members, members of this uh, conference that cooperatives are good to development, but the cooperative development lies in the hands of leaders. When the cooperative has unfair leaders, it can't be developed. It depends upon the decision of leaders to, to, to plan accordingly. If you plan for fail, you fail. If you plan for development, you develop. Almost 80% of what hinders the cooperative is the conflicts that are arising from the members who are currently leading the cooperatives and the members who were leading the, once leading the cooperative. For us, we catered for that. We decided to establish a platform which is composed of the people that once led the cooperative, like myself. I was one, I was a chairman, the first chairman of this cooperative. But by now I'm working with the cooperative, I'm contributing. You may find other cooperatives, when one is, the time is over, is now neglected and does cause a conflict. So leading cooperatives is left for elders. I insist on younger people to come and lead the cooperatives like our cooperative, all the younger people, and combine their efforts with older people to read the cooperative. That's why it is growing. Also hiring people. Uh, you may find that other cooperatives is not a priority, but when you ask them why are you not employing people, they always insist that we don't have money. You may find the cooperative is existing 20 years, they don't have employees. I always tell them that when you are not employing people, you will not get money. Because people are the ones that mobilizing resources, not resources mobilizing people. Now, I want to end up by, by insisting on what is training and uh, education. Many cooperatives are not training their, their, their members. You may find that trainings are revolving on the same people all over the year and this cause uh, them not to contribute equally. Because someone, if he is not informed, he will, con he will not contribute. Now, this is the secret behind our, our, our development, and I don't want to take much of it, because uh, transparency, democracy, accountability trainings, this is one of, of, the, uh, of the principles that also guide the cooperative. Uh, I want to end up by telling the officials of the governments that the cooperatives is the main path to development, food security, gender balance, and all the things we have closed off. So, my fellow friends, thank you for listening, and thank you, may God bless you. Thank you so much, James, for that very down-to-earth practical example of how this really works. Think of the range of services in such a short period of time that they've put together. Cradle to grave. The Rochdale pioneers would be proud. So congratulations. Our next speaker is Om Devi Mala from Nepal. Given that uh, Claudia talked earlier about internal peace and harmony, how could we not have someone from Nepal on the program? Namaste. Uh, she is uh, the Nepalese board member from, on the ICA Global Board, is vice chair of the National Cooperative Federation of Nepal. She is a former member of the parliament, has a master's degree in sociology, and a diploma in co -op edu cooperative education and management from NCCE in New Delhi. So a very, very interesting person and a great person to be, to share the board seat with. Please welcome Om Devi Mala. Good morning, everybody. Namaste and a muda ho. Uh, I'm not also, I'm not also, uh, uh, here, uh, I'm not also a researcher here, just uh, coming here to speak about peace and equality with role of cooperative. 
before and after conflict in Nepal. Mr. Chair and all the speakers and all the, uh, colleagues or cooperative colleagues from different countries. Understanding the peace, the importance of peace has been given with high priority in all sector of Nepalese society and culture. High priority, please, culture, peace, uh, priority in our culture, and peace is a most essential condition for the development of community, society, and nation. Development activities of physical infrastructure were all crossed during the conflict of Nepal. So there were, was a frozen situation of development during that period. It is most to increase the investment in education, health, and infrastructure facilities and boost the awareness of people and empower them to keep a stable peace. Development activities directly support to enhance the peace so that investment in peace is the investment on the development of physical infrastructure and human capital. Identity of income and opportunity together with poverty and political suppression are regarded as the root cause of conflict. In Nepal, the Maoist and rebellious group started armed struggle for about 10 years during 1996 to 2006 to capture political power of the ruling government and establish their own political system. It is also said that feudal social structure in which allied domination socio-political suppression on equal distribution of opportunity and resources on employment, exploitation, and poverty fuel the conflict. The conflict in Nepal brought huge loss to life and poverty the people. In that period, more than 16,000 people were killed and affected the life of 450,000 family members. 5,800 people were disabled. 71,200 people were displaced internally. 25,000 children were orphaned and 9,000 women are windowed. Beside this, 1,350 persons were disappeared. 11,000 people lost their properties, several government offices, a school, bridges, and police, police unit were damaged, but there was no any harm in cooperative. However, however the conflict was settled in negotiation and reveillance entered into the domestic democratic political system with the agreement to the change country from democratic Repub kingdom of republic. The 12-point peace accord between the rebellious political parties and the government of Nepal ended the, country, ended the conflict formally. This is an example of peace process of the world from Nepal that no external, that no any external negotiator required for a whole peace agreement. Nepalese people themselves and the political leaders played the crucial role for landing the blood cell turmoil to the peace process. In my view, it proved that people of Nepal birthplace of Lord Buddha are the honest followers of peace. This peace accord finally uprooted monarchical system and established federal democratic republic political system in Nepal. The peace accord laid the foundation for inclusive and accountable democracy. As a result, inclusive the participation of women, marginalized group, and scheduled caste in the political system is the common commitment of all parties to settle down the issues of conflict. Interim constitution of Nepal 2007 was declared which reserved 33% seat for women representation in the legislative parliament. 
Nepal is Nepal stand on the 14th position globally to send the women leaders in the parliament. The constitution of Nepal 2015 has further envisioned the inclusive development of the country by ensuring equality between male and female, giving privilege to the marginalized group and indigenous people. Currently in Nepal, enjoying peace, aiming at achieving the prosperity through the three pillar economic system of development, public, private, and cooperative. The active role played by the cooperative during that conflict was also recognized by the state constitution as cooperative is the three pillar of national economic in development of Nepal. And on equal distribution of productivity assets, resources, and opportunity put pressure for changing the economic role of the game and to introduce new agent of economic activities. This is why cooperatives are immersed as the building block of Nepal's economic for overcoming the socio-economic differences. Another point, role of cooperative for maintaining the peace and equality. The cooperative by virtue of its tradition and the existing norms and values develop the feeling of owners through the integration of people in the society. It encourages to ex exercise the participatory democracy, being socially accountable towards the member in the time of armed conflict, Nepalese cooperatives significantly contributed to the peace and equality without being affected. They, co they operated through that capital mobilization, creation of financial accessibility, and fulfillment of the create need of the people at local level. Therefore, cooperatives have been trusted by the marginalized, weak, and vulnerable people of our society, their socioeconomic environment. These cooperatives were involved in diverse phases of the economy, including agriculture and fisheries, dairy, manufacturing, financial service, communication, energy, education, health, transportation, tourism, consumer service, and so on. Cooperative as an economic enterprise work for the livelihood and employment with the organized efforts. Moreover, it has created an environment to the common people to escape from the conflict and from the exploitation of their landlords. During that insurgency period, many banks from the rural area were closed down and flew back to the urban area. However, cooperatives continued their service without any disturbances. They were managed by the local leaders and community people, so they were not much affected by the rebellions and were able to create harmony among the people, which ultimately contributed for building sustainable peace in the society. At the same time, cooperatives ensured the women's participation of different scope of life Many cooperatives in different districts regularly conduct a right-based awareness program against the social evils like women and trafficking, women and girls trafficking, sexual exploitation, yearly and forceful marriage, domestic, uh, domestic works, etc. At last, all these economic development, social justice, and inclusive activities ultimately contributed to the sustainable peace in the society. The Nepalese cooperative have more than 51% women in around 6.4 million members, more than 39% female in the total 247,000 in the leadership level, and more than 48% women employees in the total 60,000 employment in the cooperative. The cooperative have been playing the role of enhancing women leadership and lifelong learning platform for their empowerment. This increase the participation of women and marginalized people in political policy and 
decision making with equal food. Today, after a new constitution, many district level and central level cooperative leaders were elected at local and state level positions like a mayor, deputy mayor, state MPs in the election held in 2017. This became possible in Nepal because they work with local population through cooperative before and after conflict. Due to the appreciable working of cooperative during conflict, the National Planning Commission of Nepal has started including cooperative in the chapter chapter of 12th National Plan. It is, it is considered as milestone for the planet development of the cooperative. This proved that the equality has been adopted in all sectors of Nepal for the sustainable peace and moving forward, the achieving the SDG through cooperative and other stakeholders. Thank you for all for listening to me. Long life cooperative. Thank you. We had discussed the subject of peace and equality uh, some time back in our boardroom with the ICA. And after a break, uh, or during a break, uh, Om Devi came up to me and started telling the story about the Maoist insurgency and the role of cooperatives uh, pre and post conflict. And I said, you've got to tell your story. And she certainly has. Very, very well done. Our final speaker, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce her. Uh, and. It's going to be a very interesting wrap-up uh, of, of this discussion. Dr. Monique Sanzabaganwa is the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Rwanda, which is the central bank, which is a very important position. Prior to her becoming Deputy Governor, which happened in 2011, she was the Minister of Trade and Industry for the government of Rwanda. That included the cooperative responsibility so she has a direct background in terms of the relationship between government and cooperatives as private sector. Prior to that, she was Minister of Finance, or she was in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. Uh, she is chair of the National Institute of Statistics since 2012. She's a fellow of the John F. Kennedy School of Government Affairs uh, in public financial management. She's a fellow of the African Leadership Initiative in East Africa a fellow of the Aspen Global Leadership Network, very important global leadership think tank, and a member of the African Leaders Network. So a very credentialed and distinguished person with a PhD in economics. And we look very much forward to hearing Monique uh, speak. So please give a cooperative family welcome to Dr. Monique Sansabaganwa. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rwanda for those who are here visiting us from other countries. Um, I'm happy to be back home to the cooperative movement or community. But I must also say that as I will speak to the fact as a regulator of the financial sector, we also have a nice story to tell uh, from financial cooperatives as well. Um, my, um, mine is going to be uh, sharing some reflection uh, from the story Rwanda has to tell. Uh, as one country that has also experienced uh, not just conflict, but a genocide. And um, I'll have uh, three main points to make, uh, or three main parts of my uh, contribution. The first one is going to be uh, what I think about um, this assertion uh, of, on the co contribution of cooperatives to peace and equality. Then I will share the Rwandan case, um, some highlights uh, taken from our experience, and as I conclude, 
I will also make some suggestions as to how we can even harness this contribution uh, further. On uh, my uh, first point, uh, there is surely no doubt that uh, cooperatives are very important and the cooperative model is pro-peace and pro-equality as it is built on uh, principles such as inclusion, uh, social cohesion, shared opportunity, collective uh, knowledge and effort, and many, many others. And we all know that um, in cooperatives, people focus on production, like corporate uh, testimony has um, uh, put it. Uh, and as such, they have last, less time left to unconstructive engagements. Uh, as uh, Jean-Louis said, we all are the citizens of the world and uh, we have a responsibility uh, and a contribution uh, to make. And when we know that ending violence and sustaining peace uh, is a major challenge of our time, especially uh, when you look at the numbers. Uh, the experience shows that 50% of post-war countries would lapse back into conflict in the first decade after the end of the conflict. And this is a huge challenge. How can we prevent conflicts? How can we uh, have lasting positive peace? How can we sustain and maintain peace? Of course, I will agree with the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres saying that, and I quote, cooperatives in different parts of the world have effectively contributed to peace building in a positive fashion by raising equality, empathy, trust, and inclusion, end of quote. When we talk of cooperatives, cooperation goes hand in hand with promoting peace and peace goes in hand in hand with equality. Equality is about ensuring that every individual has an equal opportunity to make the most of their lives. So surely the point is made clear and loud that uh, really the cooperative model is uh, very instrumental in sustaining peace and achieving equality. This is exactly what the Rwandan case tells us. I've mentioned that one dark uh, phase in our history was uh, a period really starting around the independence time uh, where we have had a system of political dispensation that rather encouraged uh, divisions, hatred, uh, and this culminated into a genocide against Tutsi in 1994. And when we know that the cooperative movement had really started really here in Rwanda, even before the independence time in 1949, it actually was suffocated uh, by, by that type of system, although it, uh, it, has, it, uh, it had uh, tried to deliver uh, on, uh, on, on a few, or not just few, but really deliver, especially in rural economy, uh, of, of, of the country. But uh, you would agree with me that with the genocide, the cooperative 
uh, movement died also. So it was only uh, uh, during the reconstruction uh, process of the country and uh, mainly after the year 2000 when the government seriously uh, re re refocused on the, this um, uh, model, uh, mainly uh, for economic reasons, but for other uh, goods or benefits, as I, as I will try to elaborate. And looking at the outcomes that the country enjoys today, this is a country that is really inclusive, that uh, is uh, uh, growing its economy, it's reducing poverty. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, between 2000 uh, and 2016, poverty levels dropped by 20 percentage points to 38, and also inequality reduced. Uh, when we look at the Gini coefficient, it was at 0 0.5 in 2000 and dropped to 0 0.4 in 2016. Uh, the same trend on financial exclusion. Uh, we had uh, in 2008 a financial exclusion of 52% meaning 52% adult population in Rwanda was financially excluded. And this uh, dropped to 11% in 2016. And the, the, the financial cooperatives, mainly the Umurenge savings and credit cooperatives had a very key role to play in these outcomes. Uh, we have agenda gaps that have declined over time, and surely the cooperative model has played a significant role in these outcomes. How did it work? Today you have uh, uh, around 9,300 uh, cooperatives um, with a membership of above five million members. Of these, we have uh, 438 financial cooperatives, which include 416 Umurenge cooperatives. These Umurenge circles, Umurenge is um, an administrative entity under the district, and we have 416 such entities, and each of those has a savings and credit cooperative. And these 416 cooperatives uh, have a membership of 2.5 million adults. This is out of 6 million adult population, uh, of which 41% are women. And they have uh, in deposits roughly uh, 80, Eight zero million dollars, and in outstanding loans, fifty million dollars. Um, I would also say that not so formal, maybe not so formalized into cooperatives, but we have those, those uh, informal groups, and these are organized along the same principles of coming together, of solidarity, of of helping each other. Uh, so many of them. We have actually mapped 47,000 of such savings groups, and a lot of things are happening there. I will tell the story of what is happening in those groups. Uh, that's where you can find really healing taking place. You can find people learning about uh, life. You can find where people are saving and, and producing and selling or providing a service. Uh, you can uh, find really many positive things happening there. And these are the future cooperatives. Uh, so we look also to that, them as uh, also part of the ecosystem, although not really truly formalized. So with this landscape, 
I will tell what we see happening. Uh, cooperative solving four main pain points in this country. One, the social intermediation, I call it. Um, Dr. Claudia mentioned the agency, identity, all those uh, things happening. When you have an economy or a society that is coming uh, out of um, a conflict, and in this particular case, genocide. So we are seeing a lot happening there. That it goes beyond the primary activity in corporate, for instance, is producing rice. That was the, I mean, the main activity. In a circle, maybe it's financial intermediation. But you see more than that happening. You see solidarity. You see people coming together and uh, gaining scale. You see their voice going up. You see their negotiating power. You see they're growing smarter. You see they're playing actual leadership roles because they are uh, perceived by community members as the elite in the community, and they are really contributing to the governance of the society, to everything um, in, in government, in civil society, in, in church-based organizations. And, and really, this is some really worth being created there. That, that's how you call social intermediation. But also another pain point is social protection. Government has really tapped this model to, as a vehicle for key government programs on social protection. We are talking of a program targeting poverty in, 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 the, in the, the, the Umurenge, what we call Umurenge Vision 2020 Umurenge program. And this is a program targeting the poorest of the poor, including the elderly, including the disabled, and including those who, who can work but who don't have an, an opportunity. So it has an element of financial services, but also an, an element of uh, public works and an element of just alloca financial allocation. Uh, other programs such as community health insurance have been mentioned, even toolkits for the youth that is graduating from vocational training schools. Another pain point is, and this is a big one, healing and reconciliation. In our country uh, that has faced a genocide, we have really many people wounded and really struggling to, 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 uh, to really uh, come out of that, both from the side of the survivors of the genocide, but also from the side of those who were involved in committing uh, the genocide and other related crimes. So um, there is an organization I belong to called the Unity Club. And this, is, uh, this organization composed of uh, cabinet members, former and current, and their spouses. We, we partner with the National Unity and Reconciliation Commission to, to, to implement programs in peace building, and reconciliation and unity and uh, rebuilding the Rwandan identity. And the experience we have, especially with those we call Abarin Zibiji Hango, these are the people, ordinary people in the community who have really done extraordinary uh, deeds in terms of really promoting unity, in terms of protecting the pact of unity among Rwandans. And we see cooperatives really in that space a great deal. For instance, we have um, uh, an initiative in the southern part of the country where we have widows, uh, really whose uh, husbands uh, were decimated during the genocide, come together uh, with other wives of the perpetrators who are in prison and come together, manage really to talk that through, manage to heal, manage to form a cooperative, manage to do stuff, and really inspire the nation. We have such uh, uh, many cooperatives around really doing that, that, that work. And in addition to the primary economic activity they are doing, actually they are even um, gaining in terms of healing and reconciliation as part of the process. Um, I would also mention the last four, uh, fourth pain point which is orderly labor relations. 
and this is a huge thing. I can, for instance, mention a few cases. Here we have one huge financial cooperative, uh, which is mainly uh, a cooperative of uh, military forces, the CSS. It's a tremendous story. This is a huge bank. And the genesis of it is like, you have really so many um, uh, uh, people who have contributed or are still contributing or have been demobilized who have served. And you know, as a country, maybe you may not really afford uh, enough from the wage bill to, 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 to reward them. But how does the government do to deal with that situation? Really helping them to form a cooperative and save together and really achieve and grow beyond what even you could imagine. And this, there is really a very successful story here. Same model has worked for, for the teachers. We have Umari Musako achieving the same uh, really uh, how, how you can help uh, improve livelihoods of those really who are doing noble jobs but uh, in huge numbers and y y you have to come up with an innovative solution of how to really make them come together and build that strong solidarity and put their efforts together to achieve even big, bigger outcomes. We have the same model for um, the drivers who were retrenched, you know, at some point, the government of Rwanda decided actually a zero fleet policy, whereby government doesn't run a, a, a fleet because there was a lot of wastage going on there. So many drivers were retrenched, and these have really formed a, co a strong cooperative. Today, if you'd hear testimonies from those former drivers, they own their cars, actually more than one car each. They, 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 uh, the ones performing or implementing or executing even hired by government institutions with their cars today. So I can go on and on, on really how government has really managed very delicate situations on labor relations using the cooperative movement. So for me, that's positive piece. Now, to my last point, what can we suggest to do to even harness this potential more here in Rwanda, and I think this can also apply to others. One, I think since we have really evidence that these channels do work, and people there are really people-centered kind of uh, uh, people, uh, and the initiatives and the spirit they have is, is that, that in that direction, I think we can do a lot in terms of communicating and passing on education messages. It can be on anything. For instance, as a regulator, we are, we are seeing these really and using them for financial education. But we can bundle that with so many messages on peace, on unity and reconciliation, on really uh, ownership of their lives on uh, responsible citizenship, and so many, many other things. Uh, a second uh, thing maybe we could do even better is how to actually reinforce the linkages between the productive cooperatives and the financial cooperatives. I think there are a lot of synergies to be, to be, to be harnessed which we are not yet really optimizing on, but I think it's something we can really do achieve. Lastly, what I suggest is that we really uh, continue to build the capacity and get these cooperative values entrenched. You know, there is that risk of always new members joining, but rejoining really not knowing exactly what a cooperative model is and what they, are, they, they should, what are the responsibilities, what are the principles and the values. And we need really to keep in church, uh, getting this uh, hammered. We are seeing, like, uh, I liked what, uh, what James mentioned, of what unfair and bad leaders of cooperatives really can do in terms of destruction. 
We are seeing this in, some, in, in the financial cooperatives as well. The issues of governance, I think it's key. Uh, that local ownership, I think we have a lot to do there so that we, we really um, keep hammering the message that this is a really very wonderful model and it's, it, when it works well, individually people gain but also collectively gain and the country as a whole. So I wish to end it uh, at this point and thank you again for having me. Thank you, Dr. Monique, uh, particularly that last comment reminding us about being vigilant about governance. I imagine everybody in this room has one story at least where things weren't working out very well either with the CEO or general manager or the board of directors and that situation can turn the perception of a cooperative negative in almost one minute uh, and it's hard to, hard to recover from it. So thank you for that reminder and also um, for basically bringing us full circle around the ideas of empathy, equality, and inclusion as fundamentally important to how we maintain a peaceful environment that allows all people to grow. So you've got diversity as well as equality. Equity was in there too. Sometimes we leave out equity. Equity is that everyone is at the same level. And we talked about the Gini Index, for those of you who don't know it, uh, that's G-I-N-I. -I. That is the uh, gap between the highest wage earner and the lowest in a society. And the fact that that, is, uh, that gap is, is coming down for uh, Rwanda is a very interesting thing. So uh, unfortunately, we'll have to end at this point. But I do want to quickly uh, point out that in your program, um, you saw Pascalina Mitama, who was going to be here. Unfortunately, she was not able. Uh, but we do have the Vice Chair of the Amahoro Women's Cooperative here. If you would stand for a second to be recognized. Where are you? Not seeing her. Okay, uh, anyway, unfortunately we don't have time for questions. So I hope that uh, you found this panel as interesting as I did in terms of... Um, yes, sir, do you have... I'm, I'm, I, do we have a microphone? Oh, here you are. Okay. Very nice. Do we have a microphone? Okay. Sorry, sir. I had, I had asked her to, to say a few words, and then, then we'll talk to you, and then we'll have to wrap. So if you hold on just a second. Thank you. Just a few words. Thanks. Murakoze. Nitwa Mukarutabana Jane, mpagarariye cooperative amahoro ava hejuru igikondo ikorera mu karere ka Kicukiro umurenge wa gikondo. Akagari na aka kanserege n'umudugudu no wa kanserege. Eh na mpagarariye mitima Pascaline niwe ararwaye cooperative yatangiye muri bibiri na gatandatu itangirira hasi cyane turi ishirahamu ari agatsinda kagufi bamwe bakorera hirya no hino hari abakorera ku mabaraza abandi bafite bazengurukana agataru mu muhanda kwiyu twishyira hamwe turi abadamu bake cyane ariko babanyabibazo turi hasi cyane dutangiza produit eshatu tugenda twiyegeranya 2010 niho twabaye cooperative umugore mu gutera imbere twagiye kwifatanya aho turi buri muntu akajyazana icyashoboye tukungurana ibitekerezo akamaro kwa cooperative nuko nuko fatanya tukungurana ibitekerezo icyumwazi n'icyundazi akakizana tukakigira hamwe tukakibyazamo umusaruro nicyo niho 
cooperative twagiye dutera imbere ubwo twari baba damu birukankana agataro ku muhanda baba damu bajya gukora ubuyede baba damu badafite uko bameze abana bacu ntibigaga ntago twari dufite aho tuba kwari tugiye kubinzerereze akamarero ka cooperative cyo tumariye nuko twiyunze tuba abantu bamwe dutangira gukora buri muntu akaza ni imbaraga afite nunda akaza ni imbaraga afite tubona tubya tubibyaje umusaruro ikindi cooperative tumaze kwa cooperative twagize intego ana bacu bagomba kwiga abana b'umunyamuryango bagomba kwiga abana bacu yo twabarize ukajya ufatanya dufatanya tukishyurira umwana tugafatanya tukishyurira undi abana bacu bose barize uko yari yabagore babapfakazi babanyabibazo harimo nabakobwa bimfubye abakobwa twaje kubashyingira ubu bari mu ngo zabo abana bacu baje kwiga ubu barimo bamwe barangije za kaminuza abandi bari muri kaminuza intego ya cooperative rero cooperative twagize intego yo kumva ko tutazahama mu icumbi ubwo twayitangiye ducumbikiwe n'urusengero bita methodiste libre turi mu gikari cyayo tugira intego yo kuvuga ngo dushake cyo dukora intego yacu rero twayigeze ho koko cooperative byageze igihe twigurira inzu ubu dufite icumbi dufite ahantu dukorera ntabwo tugikodeshe kongiye kugira intego yo kuvuga ngo umunyamuryango atere imbere dushyiraho agasanduku ko kuzigama muri cooperative ako gasanduku niho twakuraga amafaranga yo kwishyurira abana bacu bose bakiga tugira intego yo kuvuga ngo umunyamuryango wacu ntabwo akuriye guhora azerere agenda acumbika dushyiraho intego buri muntu tuka buri umwe tukamugurira inzu igihe cyagera yanzu tuguze ko yabaga ari inguzanya agenda yagarura buhoro nayo yagarura tukongera tukagurira undi uburi buri munyamuryango wacu wese afite inzu atahamo akamarero ka cooperative no kwi no kwishyira hamwe nicyo nicyo nashaka gukangurira abantu batari muri cooperative koko iratwubaka idutera imbaraga kandi ituma ubwenge bwacu bufunguka twarebye rero ku kamaro ka cooperative icyo leta nayo itumariye leta imenya abantu muri cooperative yo mumaze kuba cooperative mama avuye muri amatsinda yo hirya no hino leta irabamenye ikaduha amahugurwa ikatwungura ubwenge amahugurwa je yo kumenya uko twizigama yo kumenya uko twacunga umutungo wacu leta nayo ikaduha amahugurwa ku gihugu cyacu rero cooperative nayo ifite igihugu akamaro kuko muri uko kwiteza imbere muri ibyo bikorwa dukora ubutumaze kugera kuri produit 80 twaratangire kuri produit ebyiri ubu dutanga imisoro imana ibamugisha munakoze sir i'm sorry we have to stop uh, because our time is uh, I, I, I apologize, but we can talk. If you could come up here, we could talk uh, on the question. Go ahead, go ahead. Let's very quickly. As, as, as quickly as possible. Yes. On occasion like this, I wouldn't pass I mean, without remembering the two uh, uh, persons, Professor Aya McPherson and Dr. Yehuda Pass, who have played a big role in uh, the ICA. And the men. The main work of these people was to, to I mean, uh, the, was on peace, was built on peace. So in 19, I mean, in, in 2007, they organized a seminar in Victoria uh, University in Canada. And I just want to remind that all these things that have been mentioned here and other things that on global level are put in a book entitled The Pursuit of Cooperatives and the Pursuit of Peace. So please take that also into consideration. 
Thank you very thank much you for that reminder. And it also, it also gives me an opportunity to think about the late uh, Professor Ian McPherson at University of Victoria, who was a very, very important player in this whole discussion. So I thank you all very much. Let's have a great round of applause for our panelists. who were fantastic. <laughs> a very short break. Can we do, Bruno, 10 minutes? OK, so we have to come back here at, uh, at, at 11.30, okay. So we need to be back here at 11.30 for the summary and conclusion. Thank you all for your kind attention.